Okay, so before we even like get into it, I just kind of wanted to like address the big thing that's there. Like obviously I'm a white woman and I'm doing research on black women and black girls. Could be problematic. Um, so when I frame the research, try to do it in a way, first of all, that is reciprocal as much as possible. And then also I think it's just super important that as white people and especially as white educators, kind of our responsibility to do the work. <coughs> the onus has like been on people of color for entirely too long. So that's the view that I take in doing this work, is that it's kind of my job to do it in some ways. I don't purport to speak for any of those people, but that's that. And then at the end, excuse me, I will um, give you some resources from some black authors that I highly encourage you to check out. So I just wanted to give that disclaimer before we start. I will just kind of briefly talk about what my dissertation was about. I'm not going like, to get into the whole thing. I know you guys already know a little bit about the school's prison pipeline. And I don't want to bore you with my dissertation forever, so I'll just give you kind of a brief overview. And if you have questions, we will open it up. Alright, so I know you guys talked about the school's prison pipeline a little bit already and the disparities that exist in discipline between, um, you know, white students and students of color. But when I did my dissertation, I wanted to focus on some of those intersections. So while yes, black boys get suspended, expelled, etc. at higher rates than white boys, the disparity is actually even greater for girls. They can kind of, kind of small, but the little infographic shows that well, black boys are suspended three times more than white boys, black girls are actually suspended six times more than white girls. So it's a much bigger disparity there. And then there's other pieces of identities that also can kind of exacerbate this. So folks that identify as LGBTQ+, folks with disabilities, also experience increased disparity when it comes to this. So when I was looking at this, um, and also if you guys want, like it's not that interesting, <laughs> but if you want, I can send this uh, slideshow. So you don't have to worry about like writing much stuff down. Um, so when I was looking at this, I looked at the issue of representational politics, which essentially just means that there are individuals who have this power in society and the way that they frame representation that kind of shape the world view ends up having real world results. And this is what happened in this case. So the representation of black women and girls leads to like what a lot of people call a carceral culture, meaning that basically black women and black girls are constantly policed and monitored and surveyed. And so then I took a specific look at some of the representational politics of black girlhood. So there's a bunch of different things. I'll try to briefly go through it. So adultification is something that happens to black boys and girls a lot, which is basically this process of them being seen as older than they actually are. So there's been a bunch of studies done that show that a white kid and a black kid at the same age the black kid will almost always be perceived to be older, which puts certain expectations in place. Um, and then the traditional values that schools have. So schools kind of value these traditional traits of white femininity, and, and that's kind of like things like passivity and subordination. Those are seen as like positive traits a lot of times in schools. And so that kind of leads to this idea that like, black girls are too much. So there's a lot of research that shows educators often refer to black girls as being loud or disruptive, aggressive, etc. And another important piece of representational politics is that it also has historical context. They have to look at over time the way these things are built up. 
So for example, one of the ones I looked at is this historical idea of like the death amount. And that leads to this idea now that black girls kind of are their bodies. And so in schools, that plays out in a lot of ways. So <coughs> dress code, black girls are far more subjected to dress code violations, sexual assault and harassment occur much more often and are often not treated as seriously. And all of that development is tied to the social structure. And there's this idea that all of this kind of comes together. There's this idea from Durkheim that says that punishment is a communicative device, which basically means they punish things not necessarily to punish that person, but to prevent other people, to show what's bad. So that's kind of the framework I was coming from and looking at this. Um, when I did it, I talked to three young black women over the course of about two and a half, three years. Um, so I really want to just kind of like, I didn't even like do any actual research for the first like six months. And really was just like getting to know each other and establishing relationship. But eventually I basically just kind of listened to them. We talked about their stories happened in their life, etc. And that's like the best part of my writing, I think, is listening to their stories. So if you're gonna read anything, I would encourage any part of my paper, I would encourage you to read their stories. Because they deserve to be heard. So I'm gonna give you just a quick kind of biographic view about each one of the types of things that I found in the search. Obviously, these are pseudonyms, so I'm not using their real identities, but... So the first one is Mia, who is a 16-year-old black female, goes to an alternative public school. She had a lot of traumatic experiences around bullying. And she had a fight at school and was expelled and arrested. She struggles to complete school, but she does. And then she ends up um, having a child that she raises with the help of her family. The second person is Trinity, who is 17. Um, she lives with her mom in a low-income neighborhood town. She's experienced trauma as a young child um, in terms of drug use in her family, watching her father almost be killed, a lot of, a lot of stuff. So then again, in school, she was um, sexually assaulted in high school and then suspended for that. So of course, that's another form of trauma. And the last one is Angela, who's a bit older. She's 30. But she had a lot to say about her experiences at school and looking back now, how that shaped her. So she, and interestingly, she's a black woman, but she was raised by white family almost entirely. So her experience was also a little different. And she went to schools that were mostly white. So she experienced a lot of bullying, et cetera. And then later in life, domestic violence, substance abuse, and incarceration. So all of this, you, I know you probably can't read this, the writing is super small, but essentially this is kind of like the model I came up with. So you have like, black girls that come to the table with certain background traumas. Um, just in general, black girls are affected by trauma far more than other groups. So they have that trauma, and they have their like, kind of particular life worlds. And they bring all of that to school. And then while they're in school, they experience all of these things, sexual harassment and assault, racial discrimination, political functions of school, zero tolerance, which I know you've talked about, and gender norms. So that's all, like, those are all forms of trauma. And then, Trauma for these girls tend not to be treated as like as trauma, but rather behavior issues to correct. So there's a lack of support that leads to increased trauma. There's a lot of times the behaviors that are actually results of trauma end up getting them disciplined. So a little bit more about trauma. So as I said, black girls disproportionately experience trauma. Some of the impacts, they alter the way the brain operates, it affects your immune, hormonal, 
hormonal and cardiovascular systems. It requires prevention of behavior of the field muscles, challenges. So those, like I said, those trauma responses often are just seen as discipline issues. There's a couple of quotes that I pulled out from my research that I thought sort of highlighted this. So Nita said that she went from being a happy kid to someone who had to learn to hold my head up and not care. Like I can't be happy no more. And then Ms. Angela, she said, when you're a kid and you don't know what's right, you just know what feels right at the time. Smoking weed and drinking and getting high and just looking for comfort, being where you can. So the lack of support for the trauma leads to some other behaviors. So of course, racism, um, oppression-based trauma is real. Like just being a person of color in this country is trauma, especially for your black girl. So teacher intervention is often viewed as like one of the most effective ways to combat bullying. But in many cases, when, it's, when children of color are being bullied, teachers don't intervene. Um, they usually see black children as being the ones that are like the aggressive in a situation. And this process of adultification that I mentioned before leads people to believe that, you know, they're not in need of much care or attention as other kids. So then I pulled another quote here from Trinity. She said they stereotype us like they think white girls are ghetto or have a class on home training. So that's just one little piece, but all three of them talked a lot about different experiences they had in school around this. The gender norm. Traditional white values of femininity are viewed as kind of like the norm for most of the time in schools. They're kind of what's value. So these things like passion, this complexity. And this is like a direct contrast with the way that most black girls have been socialized. They kind of have black girls have to be socialized in a different way to survive in the world. And those very same skills that they get taught in order to be resilient and in order to survive trauma are what get them punished and deviate from the gender norms that everybody else has. So again, that needs to be things like black girls seen as being loud and having an attitude. And their dress is expected to align traditional white femininity. So again, Nia said that she used her surgeon to take off for herself. She was being bullied, and school wasn't really doing much about it. So she stuck up for herself. And when she did, she was viewed as rough and neat. So um, sexual assault and harassment, again, um, those back to the issue of historical control of black women's bodies. And this could literally be an entire class. So I won't like get too much into it. But I, I would have to suggest like doing some research around it. The so black girl disproportionately experienced sexual harassment and assault. And of course, things like that can be traumatizing and have an impact on people's behavior and performance. And it's often exacerbated by lack of support. So the representations of black girls and black women, going back to the idea of like the Jezebel, make it seem like they can't be assaulted. So Trinity, in this particular case, and I said was a survivor of sexual assault at school, and as a result of that, ended up being suspended for 180 days. One of the other things is this kind of notion of invisibility and hypervisibility all at once. So in some cases, black women and girls feel like they're invisible in parts of what they aren't being seen. So then in some cases, they feel hyper-visible at the same time. There's like this dichotomy. So they feel like they're hyper-visible when it comes to behavioral transgression. So if you do something wrong, they're going to see it. But invisibility takes the form of many things, including lack of representation in research, and the trauma behind them is often ignored. So that part is invisible. And all this stuff kind of upholds this master narrative about who has power in society. 
So this this kind of a long quote, um, but I'll, make, I'll just explain it. So Angela, who's the one who's starting now, talked about when she was in school in about third grade, she went to pretty much an all-white school, and her teacher didn't want to help her. Um, she was being bullied by other kids. The teacher didn't want to do anything about it. So he just put her in the library, told her to go to the library every day. So she said, he gave me all my schoolwork. He told me to just go to the library. And every morning, I'd go to class, I'd get my schoolwork, and he'd say, go to the library. And so what I did was I started realizing he wasn't coming to check on me. So I would just walk home every day. I didn't do the work, but I just went home. I figured nobody knows if I was there or not. I just pushed the side, get the problem out of the way. That's how it was always. So then, in other situations, Angela talked about, for example, going to church with her white grandmother and how she felt like she stuck out. And she said, if you're going to watch me, I'm going to give you a reason to watch. So there's this kind of like tension between being invisible in some ways and hyper-visible in other ways. The last piece is schools as political institutions. So schools are one of the largest influences on the life trajectory of black girls. So what happens in schools really determines a lot for what happens to these young girls as they go forward. And essentially, schools themselves are a form of symbolic violence and trauma. They're used to promote social control, continue curriculum, reproduce, bring back to make social stratification, and they uphold damaging ideologies like misogyny and white supremacy. So even kids can tell the difference, and we talked about this a lot. So for example, Trinity says, I like to learn, I just don't like to be in here. So there's a difference between learning and what school is as an institution. So that's a lot. I know I like to zoom through it. Um, but at the end, I wanted to offer recommendations so based on the research, some ideas of things that we could potentially do to help this. So one would be restorative justice. And I know that's kind of like for these little education buzzwords right now. But a lot of times, it's not really done right. If it's ever right and with fidelity and fully done, it can be really effective. A lot of times schools can say they do it because it's, you know, the new thing, but they're not willing to fully invest time and the money into doing it right. But if you do it right, it can work. Strong informed educational practices. So like we talked about a lot, a lot of this all goes back to trauma. And trauma is just as much a component of the school to prison pipeline as pots and metal detectors. So really thinking about ways to educate in a way that is informed by the trauma that people experience. And obviously that's beneficial to everyone. And the other key point to that is making sure that that trauma-informed education is culturally responsive. Critical thinking about school safety. So imagining what school safety actually looks like. It's interesting. Um, in the district I work in anyway in Detroit. There's been a lot of conversation because just like everywhere, there's staff shortages in all the schools, and there's schools that have no security guards. The parents are concerned about that, which is understandable. But this meant, but the one little glimmer of hope is I've kind of had some conversations going about what safety actually looks like, and maybe we don't need security. So kind of reimagining what that is. And actually, most, in all of the research, most black students said that they don't feel safe with cops in their school. So, thinking about what school safety actually is. Reimagining school generally. Um, so culturally responsive pedagogy, which I know you've probably talked about. Increase the number of black teachers, so do more work to increase and retain black teachers, um, and not rely on free labor of black teachers once they do work in your schools. 
So there's often like a while back of the black teachers will do the diversity PD for free, or the black teachers will take care of the tough kids, do all that labor for free, and that's exhausting. So it's not about just hiring black teachers, but also putting practices in place to value and retain them. And I talked about this at the beginning, but just basically the idea that white teachers need to do the work, need to understand that like schools are this political institution, they're not neutral, you're either you're on one side or the other. Schools are not neutral, take your class. And then the last piece is, is sounds kind of like cliche and corny, I guess, but it's like to have some hope that another way is possible. Like if there's if you kind of lose that idea, then why do the work? So just kind of want to end on that note and make sure that we do keep some hope that things can change. And then lastly, um, like I said, I told you I'd give you some resources by some black writers that I would encourage you to check out. Um, Monique Morris has done a lot of work around this topic, so if you haven't read her book, definitely do it. She had pushed out the criminalization of black girls in school. Then she has to be a rhythm dance and blues education for the situation of black and brown girls. Then there's another great one from Matina Love called We Want to Do More Than Survive Abolition of Teaching and the Pursuits of Educational Freedom. And then finally, um, this last one, Suspended Punishment, Violence, and the Failure of School Safety from Charles Bell. Um, it's not actually out yet. I've done it a couple weeks, but um, he's from Detroit and did a lot of really powerful work around this. So maybe pre-order. And then lastly, um, it's our book, but I don't know if any of you know Student Advocacy Center here at Ipsy. Check it out. They do a lot of really good work around this. Um, I worked with them in the beginning of my dissertation, how to do some of this. Um, if you are financially able at all, I would encourage you to make a donation. They do a lot of really, really good, powerful work there. That's it. I don't think super fast. But do y'all have any questions?